What's up biology students, Mr. Holloway here. In today's video, we're going to explore several lines of evidence that support the theory of evolution and tell us how life on Earth has changed over our planet's very long history. Before we begin, remember that in science, a theory is an explanation for why we observe what we observe, and it is supported by a very broad base of evidence. A theory is not just a guess. It's the best explanation we have based on all the evidence that we have available. There are five main lines of evidence that I'm going to talk about in our video today. We'll start with the fossil record, which is where we'll spend about half the video. In the second half, I'll talk about homologous structures, vestigial structures, embryology, and genetics. By the end of this video, you should be able to summarize, in a big picture kind of way, what each of these lines of evidence can tell us about the evolutionary relationships between groups of organisms, as well as how these groups of organisms have changed over time. The first piece of evidence I'm going to talk about is the fossil record, and there is a lot to talk about. Fossils are the preserved remains of dead organisms. It could be a footprint from an extinct animal, the imprint of a plant leaf, a bone or a shell that has turned to stone over time, or even an insect preserved in amber like you might have seen in Jurassic Park. In the picture here, whole trilobites have been preserved and fossilized. Their bodies turned slowly to stone over millions of years. I don't know how old these particular fossils are, but trilobites like these are some of the earliest known arthropods. Today, Arthropods are a tremendously diverse group that includes insects, spiders, scorpions, lobsters, and centipedes, just to name a few. And we think that all of these modern arthropods evolved from a very, very distant ancestor, which looked a lot like what we see here on the screen. Fossils like these trilobite fossils help us to understand that the first arthropods looked something like this, that they appeared on Earth over 520 million years ago, and that all arthropods alive today must be the descendants of organisms like these. Typically, a fossil forms when an organism dies, usually in or near the water, and is buried under layers and layers of mud and sediment, as is the case with this dinosaur here. Eventually, these remains turn to stone under the weight of all these new layers of earth and over the course of thousands to millions of years. This usually happens with hard parts of the organism, bones, teeth, scales, shells, claws, and so forth. But, under the right circumstances, soft body parts can be preserved as well. As geological processes like uplift, erosion, and weathering change the shape of the land, rock that was previously buried can become exposed like we see here in this picture. Paleontologists and archaeologists look for these kinds of rocks in hopes of finding fossils that can teach us about life on Earth a long time ago. Fossils, after all, are how we know that the dinosaurs once existed, even though they do not exist now and have never existed at the same time as any human. Fossils provide an incomplete record of the organisms that have lived in the past. This record is incomplete because not every organism that dies is preserved as a fossil, and we certainly can never know if we've ever found all the fossils that were ever formed. Humans have been collecting fossils all over the world for more than 2,500 years, and we're still finding new species that we never knew about before. But the more fossils we find, the better our record becomes, and the more accurately we are able to tell the story of how and when different kinds of plants and animals evolved on Earth. So fossils are our record of the past, and the deeper we look in the ground, the further back in time we go. In this diagram, each layer represents a significant chunk of time, maybe a couple million years or so. This layer was formed first, then this layer, then this layer, and finally this layer. That means that these fossils are older than these fossils, which are older than these fossils, and so forth. Obviously, all these fossils are very similar, and we can infer that the similarities in both appearance and location mean that the organisms that left these fossils behind are related. Because these fossils were formed at different points in time, we can also infer that these fossils came from organisms that were the descendants of these organisms. Said another way, we can infer that these organisms are the ancestors of these organisms. 
In this way, we can start to see transitions in form that occur over the course of many, many generations. Often, these transitions are gradual as we see here, where the fossils in each layer are only slightly different than those found in the layer below. Sometimes, however, these transitions seem to happen more rapidly. As we can see here, the fossils in this layer are quite different than the fossils in the layer below. But here's the tricky part. Maybe this really was a rapid transition, or maybe layers are missing for one reason or another. Remember on the last slide how we had two more layers between this brown one and this yellow one? As a scientist, if we know that those layers exist in other parts of the world, we can infer that they should exist here, but are missing. This is why it's important to look for fossils and study rocks all over the world to make sure that we have the most complete picture possible. It may be incomplete, but the fossil record does provide us with a pretty decent timeline of life on Earth. This is why we suspect that the first cells appeared 3.5 billion years ago, because that's how far back we have to go in the fossil record before we stop finding any cells at all. Does that mean that there aren't older cells that we just haven't found yet somewhere in the fossil record? Could be, but science is not afraid to update itself when new evidence like that becomes available. But how are we able to determine those kinds of dates when dealing with fossils? There are two main ways. We can use relative dating, which really doesn't give us dates at all, but does help us to put everything together in chronological order from oldest to youngest. That's basically what we were doing on the previous two slides. Or we can use radiometric dating, referred to here in this figure as numerical dating. This method uses the known rates of radioactive decay in certain forms of elements like carbon, potassium, uranium, rubidium, thorium, and a few others. There is a ton of nuclear physics we could get into to explain how this all works, but the short version is that radioactive atoms, parent isotopes in this figure, decay or turn into other kinds of atoms or daughter products over time and at a known rate. Potassium-40, for example, decays to become argon-40, and we know the rate at which that decay happens. By looking at the ratio of potassium-40 to argon-40 present in a layer of rock or ash, we can figure out how old a rock layer is. To continue this example, let's say I find three times as much argon-40 as I find potassium-40 in a rock sample. That would be 75% argon-40, 25% potassium-40. When this rock was new, it would have had 100% potassium-40 and 0% argon-40 because none of the radioactive potassium atoms would have decayed yet. But over time, that ratio has shifted as potassium atoms decay to become argon atoms. Looking at this graph, my current ratios put us here. And according to the graph, that means that the age of this rock sample is two half-lives. Well, the half-life of potassium-40 is known to be 1.25 billion years, so two half-lives would be twice that long, 2.5 billion years. My rock sample is therefore about 2.5 billion years old, as are any fossils that I find embedded in that rock layer. Fossils below this layer are older than 2.5 billion years, and fossils found above this layer must be younger. And if we test and find the ages of all these ash layers in this diagram, then we start to be able to put together a timeline with some actual dates attached to it. If you've ever heard of carbon dating, that's essentially what we're talking about here. Although, carbon is only useful for dating things up to a few tens of thousands of years old at most. For things that are millions or even billions of years old, we have to use elements like thorium and potassium. Okay, we've talked about what a fossil is, how they form, how the fossil record is incomplete but getting better all the time, and how to determine the age of a fossil. Now, let's take a look at some of the interesting things that these fossils can tell us about evolution, because those fossils are telling us the story of life on Earth from well before we were around to witness it. For example, we've put together our story of the Cambrian explosion based largely on the fossil record, and a rare fossil formation called the Burgess Shale Formation in British Columbia, Canada. This rare fossil formation preserved many soft body parts that are rarely preserved in rock. 
And these fossils, dated to about 500 to 600 million years ago, reveal a huge number of life forms that we don't see anywhere in the fossil record until this point. So, because we've never found fossils from any chordates or arthropods or sponges before this point in time, we can infer that this is when those kinds of organisms first evolved on Earth, and that today's living chordates, arthropods, and sponges descended from these original forms. The fossil record also helps us to see how and when the first tetrapods, animals with four legs, moved out of the sea and onto land. As we can see in this series of photos of fossils, there is a very clear progression over many generations from bony fins to legs with digits. Additionally, fossil footprints tell us that the first tetrapods evolved in water and likely used their leg-like fins to move around underwater in shallow muddy areas near the shore. Eventually, as those leg-like fins evolved to become full-on legs over the course of millions of years and many, many, many generations, these animals were able to use their legs to haul themselves out of the water and onto land to hunt, forage, escape predators, and find new habitat. Now, most fish we're familiar with today, which we call ray-finned fish, don't have bones in their fins, but a group of fish called lobe-finned fishes some of whom, like the coelacanth, are still alive today, are known to have these bony bits, or lobes, that extend into their fleshy fins. By comparing these fossil fins from the past with the bones we know exist in some groups of fish living today, we can see important similarities. Based on these similarities, we can infer that the first tetrapods evolved from an ancestor that was similar to modern lungfish, a variety of lobe-finned fish that has a fleshy fin with bony lobes and a primitive lung-like structure that allows them to gulp air at the surface when they are not able to get enough oxygen through their gills alone. Those bony fins would eventually evolve into legs, as we see in this progression here, and that primitive lung would evolve into a more sophisticated lung that would eventually replace gills as the primary breathing organ. The fossil record helps us to understand that, despite what I've said before, not all the dinosaurs actually went extinct. Instead, some of them evolved to become birds. As with tetrapods, the fossil record shows us how and when this transition occurred. Like modern birds, fossils indicate that some dinosaurs had hollow bones. Additionally, there's also this hole in their hip bones that only birds and dinosaurs possess. And recently, we've been realizing that tons of the dinosaur fossils we've found over the years have evidence of feathers. In fact, we now think that dinosaurs like Velociraptor were likely covered in feathers, much like modern birds. Birds share these features with the Velociraptor and other raptorial dinosaurs because they share a common ancestor with this group of dinosaurs. And we see the evidence of that shared evolutionary heritage in the fossils left behind a clear transition from arms to wings. Fossils like this famous Archaeopteryx fossil helped us to see a relationship between birds and dinosaurs that we didn't fully appreciate or even realize until seeing these remains. There are so many examples like this in the fossil record. We see similar transitions in the history of whales and dolphins too. Fossil evidence shows that whales and dolphins evolved from land-dwelling, four-legged mammals that were kind of, sort of, similar to wolves. Over millions of years, that group evolved into the legless, ocean-dwelling mammals we know today, and we have fossils that illustrate this entire transition. We see it clearly with horses, too. The fossil record shows us a transition from a small horse ancestor, roughly the size of a dog, to the large, modern-day horse that we know today. The fossil record also helps us to know when this transition began, about 30 to 40 million years ago in the case of horses, and how long it took for this transition to occur. And of course, we can see it in our own evolutionary history as well. This is a small sampling of notable hominid skulls, and in them we can clearly see a transition from smaller to larger brain size, longer to shorter snout length, and a variety of other transitions too. The first skull here is a pretty famous one. Her name is Lucy, and she is from the species Australopithecus afarensis. She's about 3.2 million years old, and she has an interesting mix of both human-like and ape-like traits. She is very clearly an ancient relative, 
Maybe not a direct relation, but more like an extremely distant cousin. There is no evidence that she made tools. She was only about three and a half feet tall. Her brain was more similar in size to that of a modern chimpanzee, but her hips and knees indicate that she walked upright as a regular thing, which is something living apes cannot do, but humans can. The fossil record has helped us to fill out our family tree beyond just Lucy. Also in our family tree, we find Australopithecus africanus, Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and finally, Homo sapiens. That's us. Three million years of evolution separate Lucy's skull from this modern human skull. The fossil record also tells us that for much of our evolutionary history, there were actually multiple species of hominids living simultaneously. Think of these as different branches in the human family tree of evolution, most of which ended in failure and extinction. Australopithecus africanus lived at the same time as Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, while Homo erectus lived at the same time as Homo heidelbergensis. Today, there is only one species of human living on Earth, but as recently as a few hundred thousand years ago, both Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis, that's the Neanderthals, lived side by side, interacting and even interbreeding with one another. But ultimately, they went extinct and we survived. The more we look, the more fossils we find, and the better we understand our own history and evolutionary origins, as well as the broader history of all life on Earth. And remember, this is a history that extends back millions of years before what we think of as recorded history. But fossils aren't the only evidence for evolution. In fact, the legacy of evolutionary history can be seen in living organisms as well. The next line of evidence I'm going to talk about has to do with what are called homologous structures. Homologous structures are structures that have a common evolutionary origin, but not necessarily a common function. Homologous structures are evidence of evolution because they support the idea that organisms who possess these structures inherited these structures from a common ancestor. Let me explain. Modern living tetrapods, from crocodiles and birds to whales, horses, bats, and humans, may look very different, but we all inherited our four-limbed body plan from our shared common ancestor that lived hundreds of millions of years ago, before there were crocodiles, birds, whales, horses, bats, or humans. As a result of our shared evolutionary history, there are fundamental similarities in bone arrangement and structure among all tetrapods, which you can see in this picture. The bones in all these front legs are color-coded to show us that we see these same bones arranged in the same way in all these different animals. They are different sizes, sure, and these animals use their front legs for different purposes, but those are relatively small differences compared to the big samenesses we just discovered. Those samenesses are the evidence for evolution because they tell us that these structures have a common evolutionary origin, meaning that all these animals share a very distant common ancestor, and they inherited their four-legged body plan from that shared common ancestor. Vestigial structures are evidence of evolution because they also show us the evolutionary heritage of an organism. Vestigial structures are structures that have no modern function, but which exist because they were inherited from an ancestor for whom they did have a function. Human body hair and wisdom teeth are examples. These structures serve no real purpose. We only have them because we inherited them from our mammal ancestors. The pelvic bones in a whale are a classic example. Whales don't need a pelvis, after all, because they don't have back legs, but still, they have a pelvis. But remember, the fossil record suggests that the ancestor of whales walked on land on four legs. The fact that modern whales have a pelvis supports this hypothesis. Modern whales evolved to lose their hind legs over the course of millions of years after moving back into the oceans. But because evolution is a quirky process, they kept the pelvis. The evidence for evolution is right there, hidden inside their skeletons. Snakes have something similar going on. They evolved to lose their legs, all four of them, 
but they still have leg bones in their skeleton, evidence that snakes evolved from an animal that had four legs. That's why snakes are still technically tetrapods, despite the fact that it seems like they actually have zero legs instead of four. Embryology, or the study of patterns of embryo development, provides yet more evidence of evolution and shared ancestry between organisms. All living things develop over the course of their lifetime, and development can be a really complicated process. Think of our own development. We begin as a fertilized egg, or zygote, which divides countless times as we grow into a multicellular organism, with a defined top and bottom, front and back, with paired limbs and bones and organs positioned in just the right place. This complicated process is guided by many, many genes or sequences of DNA being expressed in our cells at just the right time. So, the fact that all vertebrates go through a period of development as embryos that is incredibly similar is evidence of evolution because it indicates that this complicated pattern of development was inherited by all vertebrates from the shared common ancestor of all vertebrates. This diagram here is a scientific classic drawn by German scientist Ernst Haeckel. It depicts the early embryo development of fish, salamanders, tortoises, chickens, pigs, cows, rabbits, and humans. As young embryos, before we're born, or hatched, we all look strikingly similar. We all have gills, and we all have tails, humans included. We also all have a dorsal nerve cord and a notochord, and these are the four characteristics that define all chordates. But, as we continue to develop, our appearance begins to differ more and more. Some of us lose our tails and our gills while we're still embryos, while others keep these structures into adulthood. Common ancestry explains all these similarities. We all inherited our gills, tails, nerve cords, and notochords from our shared common ancestor, even if some of us end up losing these features later on in our developmental process. Perhaps the best evidence there is for evolution lies in the universal genetic code of life, DNA. You may or may not know much about genetics, and we're not going to get into all the details in this video, but suffice it to say that DNA molecules contain a code written in these four nitrogenous bases, which we typically abbreviate as A, G, T, and C. And here's the first big piece of genetic evidence for evolution. All living things use exactly the same code. In fact, you can take pieces of DNA or genes out of one organism, like a human, and put them in a completely different organism, like a bacterium, and the bacterium will be able to read the code and follow the instructions this code contains. That's actually how we manufacture human insulin to give to people with diabetes. We put the genes for insulin into bacteria, and the bacteria become little insulin factories. The actual order of A's, G's, T's, and C's differs from organism to organism, but all our genes are written in the exact same genetic language, indicating a shared evolutionary heritage for all life on Earth. The rule here is that the more similar these sequences are, the more closely related the organisms must be from an evolutionary perspective. The genetic instructions coded in DNA tell our cells how to build protein molecules. These proteins are the real workers in the cell, and cells are defined by the protein molecules that they make. The jobs these proteins do in our cells is what gives us our traits. For example, the pigments that determine our skin, hair, and eye color are proteins, as are the growth hormones that fuel our so-called growth spurts during childhood and adolescence. Our DNA tells our cells how to build those proteins, and those proteins give us our traits. Humans have about 25,000 genes, and those genes are incredibly similar throughout our species. Humans are, on average, about 99.9% .9 genetically identical to one another, and it's that very small 0.1% difference between one person and the next that accounts for all our physical differences. Because genes get passed from parents to their children during reproduction, we can use genetic similarities to determine relatedness. For example, you would be more genetically similar to your parents than to your grandparents. 
and would be more genetically similar to your grandparents than to your great-grandparents, and so forth. The farther back in your family tree you go, the less genetically similar your ancestors will be to you due to random genetic mutations and the mixing of DNA that occurs during sexual reproduction. This pattern extends well beyond humans. Go back 10 generations in your family and you'll find noticeable genetic differences. Go back 100 or 1,000 generations and those differences will be even larger. Go back 100,000 generations and now you're starting to see genetic differences that are big enough that we definitely can't call the organism we are looking at a human anymore. Go back about 200 to 250,000 generations and now we're looking at something that looks a lot like Lucy. Now, we can't actually test Lucy's DNA, but we can test the DNA of other living organisms to look for relatedness. Think of it this way. Siblings would have very similar DNA because they inherit their DNA from the same parents. They're only one generation removed. Cousins would be less similar because they don't share parents, but they do share grandparents, making them two generations removed, and that relationship would show up in a genetic analysis. Your cousin's cousin would be even less similar to you because they don't share parents or grandparents, but they do share great-grandparents, making them three generations removed. And once again, we'll be able to see this relationship by looking at genetic similarities. And if we continue to expand outward like this, this pattern also continues beyond humans. Just like we can test two people's DNA and say that they share an ancestor who lived five to ten generations ago, we can compare the DNA of humans and non-humans to determine how long ago they shared a common ancestor too. One way to do this is by looking at the proteins made by different groups of organisms. This works because DNA, or genes, code for these proteins. So if the proteins are similar, the genes that code for them must be similar too. For example, Hemoglobin is a protein found in red blood cells that carries oxygen around the body to where it is needed. Since all vertebrates make hemoglobin proteins, we can compare how these proteins are made to see how closely related we are. The hemoglobin proteins made by rhesus monkeys are about 95% identical to human hemoglobin, whereas frog hemoglobin is only about 54% similar. That means that the genes that code for these proteins are also about 95% identicals in humans and rhesus monkeys, but only about 54% identical in humans and frogs, which is still significant, but all of that is to say that from an evolutionary perspective, we are much more closely related to rhesus monkeys than we are to frogs. That absolutely does not mean that we evolved from rhesus monkeys, however. What that means is that humans share a much more recent common ancestor with rhesus monkeys than we do with frogs. Our common ancestor with rhesus monkeys likely lived around 30 million years ago, while our common ancestor with frogs lived more like 360 million years ago. For reference, remember that Lucy lived just about 3.2 million years ago and that all of recorded human history has occurred within just the last 5,000 years, just to give you a sense of scale. Suffice it to say that we could keep going through each of these five lines of evidence and coming up with more and more and more examples that support the theory of evolution. We could keep going through examples for hours, but hopefully you've got the general idea by now. Let's summarize. We learned a ton about the fossil record in the beginning of this video. We learned how fossils are formed, how we determine their age, and what they can tell us about the order in which key evolutionary steps occurred. We also saw a bunch of examples of interesting transitions preserved in the fossil record, in tetrapods, in birds, in whales, in horses, and in humans. We talked about homologous structures, like the bones in our forelimbs, and vestigial structures, like the pelvis in a whale, and how they can teach us about a group's evolutionary history. We talked about embryology, and how animals that look very different as adults look strikingly similar as embryos, and can develop according to very, very similar, but very complex patterns. And then we brought it all together with a little genetics, talking about how similarities in genetic sequences, and the protein sequences they code for, can show us how groups of organisms are related to one another.
The evidence that supports the theory of evolution comes in many different flavors, and we are finding more evidence every day. This evidence suggests a shared common ancestry among the living creatures on planet Earth, and helps us to understand how the evolutionary process has changed life on Earth over its long 4.6 billion year history. It is interesting to note, I think, that in Darwin's day, nobody had any idea what a gene was or what DNA was. But even without that knowledge, Darwin's theory has withstood the test of time. In fact, the more we learn about DNA and genetics, the more this knowledge supports and enhances our understanding of biological evolution. And today, genes and genetic similarities are possibly the most important evidence of common ancestry that we have. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, everyone.